it is that time, seven o'clock Mountain Standard Time, time for 60 minutes in space. Let me remove that there and uh, show you our beautiful smiling faces. Hello, everybody. My name is Jose Zuniga. I am from the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, and I will be your virtual host for the evening. Uh, we will have a brief presentation followed by a Q&A question and answer session. If you have questions during the presentation, you can type them in the chat. You don't have to wait for the Q&A. I will be monitoring the chat and we will try to answer as many of your questions as we can. We are so excited that you are joining us this evening and I am excited to introduce you to Dr. Kuchun Yu, our Curator of Space Sciences here at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, who's gonna be sharing all of this wonderful information. So without further ado, uh, Dr. Kuchun Yu, please take it away. All right, thank you very much, Jose. Um, so uh, welcome everyone. And for those of you who are not familiar with 60 Minutes in Space, this is a program where we talk about um, some of the latest um, space science news that has um, popped up in the last month. And I am an astronomer here at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. And so my specialty are things in astrophysics and astronomy um, and everything outside of our solar system. And so I'll um, we'll, uh, begin with um, some objects that are um, closer to home, um, stars and planets. Um, but then um, my last story will encompass a good fraction of the galaxy. So um, we'll be doing a whirlwind tour of um, at least our local universe. And uh, what I'll do is I will share my screen. And uh, so, so my first um, story um, today has to do with an announcement uh, that came out this past month about the discovery of not only a, uh, a planet around another star, but actually evidence for a moon around, or um, possible moons around a planet around um, another star. So um, this is the PDS-70 system. It's a, um, it's a planetary system um, located um, just under 400 light years away. And astronomers have been observing this system for a few years. It's a relatively um, young solar system. Um, we think it's uh, no more than about 5 million years old. And uh, the star is about 3 quarters the size of the sun, so pretty close um, to the sun in size. And so you'll see um, you have um, this interesting looking ring um, structure and uh, the, the stars in the center. And off to the right of the star, there's a, a little bright speck. And so that speck um, turns out to be um, the, um, the, one of the planets. Um, so the, the way that astronomers um, name uh, stars and planets, um, it, it, it's kind of, um, you know, um, not the most elegant way, but uh, the PDS-70 system, the main star, um, what, what they do is they'll um, add the letter A to the name. So the star in this case is PDS-70A. And for um, every subsequent object that is known that's part of that system, they increment that letter of the alphabet. So there's a planet B, uh, PDS-70B, but the, uh, the spec to the right of the star is actually PDS-70C. And so we'll talk um, more in a few minutes about uh, this particular discovery. But what I want to do is give you some background as to um, how planet um, systems form. And so um, let's um, jump ahead to the next slide. And, and basically um, stars and solar systems form out of gas clouds in our galaxy that are gravitationally unstable and they collapse and the collapse um, create, um, ends up where, um, where you have the gas pan um, collapsing into a pancake, um, gas and dust um, orbiting the star and uh, material from this accretion disk uh, falls into the star and what's left over um, can end up forming planets. And for a long time, um, astronomers and uh, both observational and theoretical astronomers imagine that you might have um, little microscopic uh, bits of dust, um, smoke-sized um, particles in these uh, um, stellar disks, these accretion disks. And over time, they might um, orbit and run into each other. And so they would stick and they would grow over time until um, the, the dust particles grow into pebbles and the pebbles keep accreting until you get larger and larger bodies. And then finally you get um, objects that are large enough that they start um, accumulating the gas that's in the nebula. But uh, there are also other ideas. Um, in recent decades, uh, people have also realized that you can actually have 
um, planets collapse directly out of the disk due to what are known as gravitational instabilities. And so um, these um, can actually happen much, much faster than that slower process of um, imagining dust particles sticking together, clumping together, and then encountering other bits of um, uh, rock and pebble um, that slowly grow over time. And so we, um, you know, there are multiple ways we think in which planets could form, um, and but there's still a lot of investigations um, right now trying to determine which of these possibilities are correct. And so uh, observational astronomers and astronomers who run computer simulations are still um, trying to grapple with this problem. And uh, here's another simulation. Um, we're, we're seeing the disk from above and, uh, and you have a planet forming, but what happens is that uh, these planets or these protoplanets are accreting material from the disk. And as they continue to, to orbit, they can also generate these waves. You can see this um, spiral wave um, where a gap is forming, um, where material is flowing um, onto the planet, but um, it's just an interplay of gravity and radiation. You get these um, marvelously um, you know, strange looking uh, spiral structures. And, um, and, it's, and it seems like there are ways in which you can create gaps in the disk as more and more material flows into the planet. And these are gaps that um, have actually been observed. And so um, the ALMA Observatory down in Chile, it's a set of radio telescopes. Um, and by um, putting together all the um, data streams from multiple telescopes, you can actually um, image down to extremely fine detail. And so these are um, 20 different um, disks uh, from nearby um, very young solar systems. And you can see a lot of, um, I mean, all of these have um, hints of um, gaps, if not outright um, look, looking gaps. And we think these are gaps that have been cleared by um, young planets that are forming, that are orbiting around those young stars. They've um, pulled um, out a lot of the gas and dust in those disks. And so these gaps suggest that there are multiple planets forming. And so we're seeing um, today a lot of evidence um, showing us how solar systems form. Now, the PDS-70 system has been observed um, by many different teams of astronomers in recent years. Um, and so this is a paper from 2018 that shows um, the two planets. So earlier we didn't see uh, planet B, but here uh, you can see um, the, the blue image on the left is uh, an image showing, showing hydrogen gas, the glow from hydrogen gas, and the other two images in the center and the right are in the infrared. And so um, you um, see the, um, the central star marked with a little um, white um, star icon, but, and then um, in circles, uh, we see the, um, the two planets. So B, um, PDS-70B is the one below the star, and PDS-70C is the one um, off to the right. And C is also the one that's associated with um, that disk. Um, it looks like a donut. And uh, the team that um, announced the paper uh, this past month um, actually had uh, all my observations uh, that they published two years ago. So this is from their earlier paper. And their earlier paper didn't have um, as many uh, or as, um, as much um, time on um, with the telescopes. And so um, it was. Um, Although in this particular image, you can actually sort of make out PDS 70B, uh, but the, uh, they um, could just barely uh, make out uh, planet C and just barely distinguish it from the, the Taurus, the, uh, what's remaining of the, of the disk. And so that's why uh, they um, went and requested more time with ALMA and got better observations. And that's what they published um, just recently. And so um, here we have a zoom in to, um, to PDS-70C. Um, and the size of the system um, is um, roughly about um, 30 astronomical units or 30 times the Earth sun distance. So this is roughly about the distance between um, the, uh, the sun and Neptune. And then the size of um, this blob is um, roughly about uh, the the, the scale of the Earth um, Sun uh, distance. So what we uh, what astronomers call one astronomical unit, that's the size. Now in the, the radial um, wavelength that these telescopes are observing at, what you're actually seeing 
is emission from warm dust. And so uh, there is a lot of gas um, in the system, but it's not emitting in the wavelengths that, um, that these observations are made in. And so we think that there could be a hundred times to a thousand times as much mass and gas um, in, in the system, but we're not seeing it. We're only, uh, the telescopes are only sensitive to um, emission from warm dust. And so, and that's the reason why the star, you know, we normally think of the stars as being these bright objects, but um, the central star here doesn't appear very bright because what we're what they're imaging is the cloud of dust that is in orbit close to the star. So um, what um, the the astronomical team that has done these observations, what they're inferring is that in addition to the planet and the star, there's enough material um, surrounding PDS 70C, that um, planet that's labeled there, to suggest um, that there is uh, material uh, that's what we um, can call a circumplanetary disk, meaning a disk of an accretion disk of gas and dust that's circling the, um, the planet. And so they infer that there, um, there are the beginnings of um, moon formation around this planet. And, um, and the closest analogy that we have, at least in our solar system, is actually uh, the planet Jupiter. And so the um, planet Jupiter, um, the largest planet in our solar system, has um, I think close to about 80 moons, but many of the close-in moons, the largest moons, orbit in a plane um, basically in line with Jupiter's equator. So we think that the, the so-called Galilean moons, named after um, Galileo, who first discovered them, they formed out of an accretion disk, um, a circumplanetary or circum-Jupiter disk, um, that um, existed around Jupiter early in the solar system. So um, this is um, very similar to how, um, you know, this would be similar to how PDS 70C um, might, might be going around that system. And, um, and astronomers um, have um, worked on simulations of how the Galilean moons formed. And so this is one from last year by Constantine Antigen and Alessandro Mortadelli. Um, and, uh, and this shows um, Jupiter in the center and the gas disk um, surrounding it. And you can see the uh, simulation run through uh, thousands of years. And the bars um, on the, uh, to the right represent the four Galilean moons, so Io and Europa and um, Ganymede and Callisto. And they're basically showing how um, in this particular sim simulation, you can actually grow um, the moons to their current size um, in this particular simulation. So um, there's um, definitely plenty more interesting work um, to be done um, with uh, PDS MD and other similar systems. And it just shows you um, how um, increasingly better our telescopes are in um, getting uh, in resolving really small structures because um, you know before um, ALMA, um, you couldn't really see um, structures um, that's details that small on, on the sky. And so with new technology, um, we have um, better um, observations and, uh, and new discoveries. All right, so for my second story, I want to talk about the star Betelgeuse. And, um, and this is um, a story um, that actually came out a couple months ago. And so it's, um, it's actually not that new, but um, since we've talked about Betelgeuse in the past, I thought we would um, go back um, to it. And uh, Betelgeuse is a red supergiant star. Uh, for those of you who um, are familiar with the constellations, um, it's the left shoulder of the constellation Orion. Orion is, is a wintertime constellation, so you can't see it um, right now up in our sky. Um, but um, it's, it's um, when you um, do um, go out and look for Orion um, in the late fall or any time in the winter, um, you'll actually notice a distinctly reddish um, star, and so that's Betelgeuse. Um, it's about 700 light years away, and it's uh, what they call a red supergiant, and so this is a star that's actually at the end of its life, and so uh, the star has expanded um, into um, something that if you put it in our solar system, it would um, basically get very, um, the surface of the star um, would be close to where Jupiter orbits. That's how enormous uh, Betelgeuse is, and so this um, plot um, shows you um, at the top 
um, where the sun and uh, the planets in our solar system would be. And so you can easily see all the inner planets from Mercury um, to Mars would be completely swallowed up by the um, enormity of Betelgeuse. Now, Betelgeuse um, is um, an object um, that I said, as I said, is towards the end of its life. And these stars um, are extremely variable, meaning um, they um, don't have a, um, a calm, um, smooth surface like um, we see for the sun and other stars that are in the, the normal part of their lives. Um, and instead, the, um, of course, if you look at really small grain detail on the surface of the sun, you do see a lot of whirling and boiling motions, but they're at extremely small scales. But for these super giant stars, um, the entire surface um, bubbles and boils at um, scales that are actually um, almost visible, um, or they make up a large fraction of the surface. And uh, in addition, um, these stars also pump out um, winds. And so they actually boil up parts of their surface. And so we think, um, and we've actually observed, you'll see in just a minute, that there's, um, there's an expanding wind or a, um, clouds of gas that have erupted from the surface of Betelgeuse. And those, um, those clouds of gas are expanding outwards, having been expelled from, from the star. Um, and because of this variability, the fact that the star is extremely um, variable. Um, it's also variable in brightness. And so um, Betelgeuse actually has about a 400 day cycle where it gets um, uh, brighter, more luminous, and uh, also um, cycles and, and um, becomes less luminous. And so this plot shows over the last six years or so um, that um, sort of variability. And, um, and so for the first, uh, from about 2015 to about 2019, you see that um, you know, the, um, the, you see the variability of, of Betelgeuse when it um, goes up and down. But starting um, soon after 2019 and through 2020 of last year, it had this really dramatic drop. And, um, and you can see how big of a drop it was compared to past years. And this is called the great dimming by astronomers. And you might have even heard in the news, and this is something that I reported on in the, the previous 60 Minutes in Space, that there was speculation that um, you know, Betelgeuse might be at the end, uh, very end stages, um, that it could be on the verge of going supernova. Um, although people who um, were really knowledgeable um, experts on uh, red supergiants, um, they were also saying that uh, Betelgeuse probably wasn't going to go supernova because um, it, um, given um, observations of other stars that did go supernova, uh, they thought that Betelgeuse probably had a few 10, 000, um, tens of thousands of years left if not 100,000 years. But as you can see, in um, towards the end of 2020 and into 2021, Betelgeuse has uh, kind of gone back um, to, um, to what we think of as, as being normal. Um, and so, um, so um, it, it, was, it was definitely very mysterious why um, the brightness plunged so much. And, um, and, and I think the, uh, the observations that really nailed it um, came in the past, um, well, from 2019 to 2020. And this was um, led by, um, a, a, this is a team of astronomers led by Miguel uh, Martage, who's uh, from the Observatory um, of Paris. And, um, and he got uh, observations at the Very Large Telescope in Chile in the Southern Hem um, Hemisphere in South America. Uh, this is run by the European um, Southern Observatory. And, uh, and at the time there was, um, you know, a lot of interest in Betelgeuse because um, observers were noticing that um, the, its brightness was uh, going down dramatically. And normally when you um, try to observe at a big observatory, like the Very Large Telescope, you have to submit a proposal and the proposals get reviewed. And, um, and this process can take many months. And so um, uh, getting time on an observatory um, can um, be a multiple month um, affair. Uh, but because um, things were happening really quickly uh, with Betelgeuse, the uh, director of the observatory uh, put out a call for um, immediate proposals that could be uh, where they could use director's discretionary time. And uh, the director's discretionary time is a small block of time that's set aside in the, uh, at um, all observatories, almost all observatories have this. And um, for sort of emergency observing, if something's happening right now, they want to have um, observations done right away, 
he can um, take some of that uh, director's discretionary time and use it. And so um, Montarge, the, uh, the astronomer, um, wrote a um, really fast proposal and, uh, and they were able to get time within um, just a few days instead of the many months that it would normally have taken. And, um, and so they got time in 2019 and then they also got time in early 2020. And the last observations were actually done in March 2020. And, um, and uh, luckily they actually were able to get their last observations just three days before the observatory shut down because of, um, of the COVID uh, pandemic. And, um, and then uh, observatories throughout the world have been kind of in flux and, um, because of the pandemic. And so um, I'm not sure if anyone, I mean, people might have um, gotten observations again uh, this year, but um, no one has written papers about that. So um, if you look at the, uh, these images uh, that were taken by um, uh, their team, you can see that um, in, in um, the very large telescope, has um, special instrumentation that allows them to actually uh, measure or observe. Um, you know, oftentimes it's impossible to actually see the shape of a star because stars are so small relative um, to the distances that we see them at. But uh, for Betelgeuse, a star that's so massive and it's relatively close. And so with the instruments um, at the very large telescope, they're able to actually um, image the shape of Betelgeuse. And so you can see that Betelgeuse um, isn't a completely round object. It's actually somewhat asymmetric. Um, and that, again, has to do with kind of the blobbiness of Betelgeuse as convection and the boiling of the surface results in um, kind of an irregular shape to it. And what you notice is that in January 2020, um, that actually um, was um, at the minimum brightness of Betelgeuse. And so you can see that the lower right um, corner of Betelgeuse looks noticeably dimmer than um, the, the rest of the star. And, um, and then in March 2020, um, it's, it's actually coming out of um, that minimum um, luminosity, but um, that lower right corner still um, looks um, dimmer. And so um, the interpretation um, by uh, the paper, which was um, released um, back in, in the spring, um, early summer, was that Betelgeuse actually cooled, or part of it cooled off by about 500 degrees Celsius. Um, and that in turn led to that part of the star being about 10 times dimmer than what it would normally be. And so um, what um, happened is that, uh, well, um, let me go on to the next slide. Is, um, I mentioned earlier that Betelgeuse has a lot of gas that it expels, um, and so this is an image of the the nebula or the um, gas that's around Betelgeuse. And so the very in um, the tiny um, red circle that you see um, on the very inside that corresponds to the surface of Betelgeuse, um, and then uh, that um, that inner circle represents a, a different image um, that's been taken of just the inner nebula. And then the outer um, image is with a different instrument um, showing just the outer, just how far the gas that, um, that was expelled from Betelgeuse um, has spread out, um, expanding outwards from Betelgeuse. And so what the astronomers think happened is that because um, the, that part of Betelgeuse cooled off by a factor of 10, um, it dropped by hundreds of degrees, um, the gas that was directly above that, um, that part of Betelgeuse also cooled off because it wasn't being irradiated uh, by as much um, electromagnetic radiation from the star. And so as that gas cooled off, um, it condensed and formed um, dust. And this is something that we know happens with red giant stars, that the winds that they, that they spell out um, as they get further and further from the star, um, atoms um, in that star can actually condense into um, dust. And we see this in this artist's animation where you see um, the lower right hand corner of the star is noticeably darker, it's noticeably cooler, and um, in the region um, of the cloud, um, um, a little bit further away from uh, that star, um, it, um, this is actually scaled down. So we think it's um, probably about 2 billion kilometers from the star, and the cloud itself is um, up to about a billion kilometers in size. But uh, that gas um, condensed into dust. And so you basically had blockage of light from the star. And that explains 
why uh, the star dimmed over those periods of months um, and between uh, 2019 and 2020. And then what happened was um, Betelgeuse then uh, brightened up. So we no longer had that dark spot on the surface. And once um, Betelgeuse regained its original luminosity, um, then all that radiation then ended up destroying the dust cloud. And so the dust cloud then um, kind of evaporated and, um, and all those atoms returned back to the expanding gas cloud. And um, so, so right now, this appears to be the best explanation for, um, for why Betelgeuse dimmed. And as far as um, re um, future research, you know, it's still um, uncertain as to whether um, these clouds um, of gas that emanate from red supergiant stars like Betelgeuse, whether um, they come out as a continuous stream, as, as a wind, or whether uh, Betelgeuse burps up um, um, these clouds of gas. Um, so there's some uncertainty whether um, this is due to a continuous stream of gas or whether it's episodic. And, uh, and then the other question is, you know, is this something, um, what we saw, is this something uh, that's unique to Betelgeuse? Um, now, um, we think that the Milky Way galaxy has probably um, tens of thousands of red supergiant stars, but only about uh, 100 to 200 of them are actually close enough um, to be visible to us. And uh, only about 10 of them are really monitored by astronomers. And Betelgeuse happens to be the best observed star out of that bunch. And so um, perhaps um, you know, we have observed this because Betelgeuse um, is uh, the most observed. People are constantly uh, observing, um, looking at it and making uh, observations, recording it. And that's uh, why we've noticed it. And perhaps if we um, observe the other uh, red supergiant stars, we would also um, notice this um, sort of activity. Uh, but that's um, a question for, uh, for future work uh, for astronomers. All right, so um, let's um, continue. Um, like I, I promised, I wanted to, um, to move on um, um, past uh, or the, the, these closer objects and talk about um, our galaxy as a whole. And uh, one question I want to pose to you, uh, the public uh, watching this, is how do we know um, what the shape of our Milky Way galaxy is? And our Milky Way is a collection of hundreds of billions of stars of which the sun is just one member. And we know that um, our Milky Way is also one out of many hundreds of billions of stars that are uh, visible in our known universe. But um, given the fact that um, we live inside the Milky Way, so and we've never sent space probes um, to go outside of, of our galaxy because um, we um, our spacecraft just don't go that fast. And so this artist's depiction of the Milky Way, you know, gives us a a model of a spiral galaxy with these spiral arms and the sun located um, at the center of these lines that are radiating out from it. So how is it that um, we've deduced the shape of our galaxy um, while being stuck inside the galaxy? Well, if you um, were to go out and look at, um, go out to a very dark site and observe, um, and your eyes are um, really good and it was dark and far away from um, city lights, you would notice a very faint band in the sky. And um, ancient people um, recognize this. And so the Milky Way has been known for many tens, if not hundreds of thousands of years. And, um, and if we use modern astrophotography, photography, we can um, get glorious pictures like this showing the Milky Way. And it's called a Milky Way because you know, people imagined um, ancient gods spilling um, milk across the sky uh, because they saw this very faint fuzzy band, but with modern uh, photography, you can see that it's clearly um, made up of uh, many um, thousands, millions of stars. Um, these, these telescopes can make out um, numerous um, stars in uh, the patches of the Milky Way that look like just faint fuzzy, uh, fuzzy patches. And so um, even just by looking at the sky, you get a sense that um, we sit inside um, something that could be like a disk or like a, uh, an ellipsoidal blob. And this is um, something that astronomers have also wondered about going back hundreds of years. And so Willem Herschel in 1785 came up with this map of the Milky uh, of um, what he imagined our system of stars 
um, would be like. And what he did was he assumed that all stars had the same brightness. And so um, um, then he would um, look in different parts of the sky and count the number of stars that he observed. And so by um, looking all over the sky and counting stars, which um, as you can imagine, you know, was a very tedious task. And at that time there um, weren't photographic plates. He had to do it uh, by eye, although he did have uh, the help of his telescope um, that, that he could use. Um, but he basically created uh, this model of the Milky Way and the sun is um, one of the, um, the brighter or the bigger um, stars that are, um, that's not quite at the center, it's kind of left of center. And so that's where he imagined the sun to be. But um, of course, this um, isn't quite correct because as it turns out, you know today that um, stars are not all the same uh, brightness. And so if, um, if there are brighter stars um, that are further away, um, you could mistake them for um, you know, a dimmer star that's up close. And so this would um, not give you an accurate model of, um, of what the Milky Way um, would really be like. And even um, soon after, um, or even before, um, he made this map, there were other astronomers who really questioned the assumption that all stars were the same brightness. Um, so, uh, but um, over time, astronomers realized that stars uh, did have uh, different brightnesses. And so we jump ahead um, to the 20th century and uh, Jacobus um, Captain came up with this model of the Milky Way. And um, here in the um, there's a um, yep, dot um, close to the center and off to the right, that's um, shaded in yellow and there's a letter S next to it. That's supposed to be the sun. And those concentric um, sort of ellipses represent different um, densities of stars. So the stars are uh, most numerous towards the center. And as you go out uh, with each ellipse, you get to fewer and fewer stars. And, uh, and again, this was uh, based on star counting, but um, by that time people had um, figured out um, that, um, and actually Captain had, had figured out the spread in stellar luminosities. So he figured it out for stars around the sun and, he, and then he assumed that the same spread and brightnesses applied um, throughout the Milky Way. And so he came up with this model where the Milky Way was basically this, um, this sort of ellipsoidal blob that was about 5,000 light years up and down and about 40,000 light years from one end um, to, the, to the other. So, these, um, so this is how big he thought um, the Milky Way was. And uh, I mean, he's actually off by you know, maybe a factor of two. So it wasn't too bad off, off. but um, he put the sun close to the center which was um, very, um, very far off. Now, um, Harlow Shapley in the early um, 20th century was observing, um, and, and by then um, astronomers have come up with ways to um, have more or less accurate, you know, within order, uh, within a factor of two accurate distances to stars. And so what Harlow Shapley did was he um, measured the distances to globular clusters, which are very tight, um, very um, bound clusters of hundreds of thousands of stars and they were easy to spot and he was able to measure them. And, and this is a, a figure from one of his papers. And again, the sun is the yellow um, dot, um, in this case at the center, and all those arrows represent um, sort of error bars for um, locations, uh, or, or actually they, they, um, they represent, the, the arrows point to where the globular clusters are and the length of the arrows represent um, the height of the globular um, cluster above the galactic plane. Um, but he noticed that the globular clusters weren't clustered around the sun, uh, but they were clustered in a direction um, towards the constellation of Sagittarius. And so this suggested that the sun um, wasn't near the center of our galaxy, that we in fact orbited um, quite far away from the galactic center. And um, by the 1950s, um, other astronomers, um, you know, we had, um, recognize that there were different types of stars. There are massive stars that were, um, that, um, that were extremely bright. Um, and there are lower mass stars that were not very bright at all. Uh, the sun is one of these low mass stars. And uh, astronomers um, started mapping the locations of these massive stars. And so in 1951, at a conference uh, proceeding, or at a conference of the American Astronomical Society, he gave this talk. And, uh, and this was actually a slide um, a glass plate slide that he showed at, at this talk of the locations of star of um, extremely bright stars, these what we call the O and B stars. And um, the sun again is at the center of 
plot of, of those circles and those radiating lines and those white dots are the locations of the bright massive stars that he had plotted out. And what he started to show were the ink planes are of three spiral arms. And, and, um, and people had know, knew about spiral arms um, in other galaxies. We were, um, observed other spiral gal galaxies outside of our own Milky Way. And so here was the first, some of the first evidence that um, our own galaxy was a spiral galaxy, just like these other um, external galaxies. And we um, and so here's a later paper, um, again based on that same work, but updated. Um, and they show um, again the sun at the center um, with that yellow um, S, and um, and those bright um, white dots are the locations of the um, of the young clusters of stars, um, which contain lots of um, those massive O and B stars. And again, you get the hint that there are three uh, spiral arms. Um, and then um, roughly at the same time, um, there were um, like right around 19, um, the early 1950s, um, there were radio astronomers who started to map our galaxy in radio waves. And this is uh, kind of a summary paper, uh, but it shows one of those early maps. Um, and this is kind of hard to read, but if you look at um, kind of the, those blobs, those, are, um, those blobs represent hydrogen gas that were mapped. And again, you can see a hint of spiral arms. And so um, by the 1950s, astronomers were pretty sure that um, our Milky Way was a spiral galaxy that was mostly flat, but it had these beautiful full spiral arms and our sun was located not at the center, but was about halfway through. And so this is the picture that we have today. Um, so over 30, 70 years um, worth of observations in different wavelengths, visible, um, infrared, radio, we've come up with this picture um, where we have these multiple uh, defined arms of the Milky Way galaxy. It's not just um, a spiral, but it's um, what's known as a barred spiral. So the very central region of the galaxy you can see is sort of stretched out into a bar and there are spiral arms that originate from the, uh, from the edge, of, uh, from the two ends of the bar. And, um, and there's still some debate about how many arms there are, um, you know, whether there are two main arms and you have minor arms taken out of them or whether there might be four arms or more arms, but um, there are at least um, what we call the Scutum Centaurus arm. And then also the, um, um, you know, the, um, the Perseus arm and the Sagittarius arm might be a minor arm. And the sun happens to be passing through what's known as the Orion spur of the Sagittarius arm. So you can see that if you follow the Sagittarius arm off, there is a, a little spur or a spike that comes off. And, um, and the other thing that you'll notice about the arms is that the arms are, are the places where you have um, dark gas clouds. These molecular um, clouds um, are the places where um, the uh, stars form. Uh, portions of, the, of these clouds collapse and um, stars, uh, clusters of stars form out of them. And, um, and oftentimes when you have lots of stars forming, tens of thousands of stars, forming all at once from these cl um, cloud collapses, um, you also get lots of massive stars, those O and B stars. And so if you look closely, um, you'll see um, sprinkled along the arms are um, um, little um, red uh, pinkish regions and also bright white regions. And so the pink regions are uh, regions where hydrogen gas has been ionized by those massive stars. And so they basically show off these hot blisters of 10,000 degree um, gas um, with lots of young stars um, clustered in them. And then as the um, stars go supernova and as the winds of the stars break up the gas clouds, then you're left with these um, very young um, clusters of stars. And those are the, um, the bright um, white specks. Those are supposed to represent the young clusters. And so we tend to find star formation and young clusters of stars along um, the spiral arms. And we see that not only in our galaxy, but in other galaxies as well. So what I want to talk about is this new paper um, coming from uh, Michael Kuhn um, from Caltech and his collaborators. And, um, and their work shows that not only do we have the Sagittarius arm and the Orion spur and the Scutum arm, but it appears that there is this weird um, spiral arm break or uh, an additional spur that um, juts out from the Sagittarius arm. And what they did was they uh, observed um, star forming regions 
um, including ones that um, are, are probably familiar to many of you. And uh, because we have um, new um, data from the Gaia satellite, um, they're able to place the locations of the star forming regions um, really accurately. And they all uh, pretty much line up along this um, star arm break. And so in their paper, what they do is they combine um, Spitzer observations um, and Spitzer is an infrared um, telescope. And so in the infrared, you can peer through a lot of the gas and dust. And so your, um, your, your observations are, aren't blocked uh, by these um, clouds. And, um, and so they're able to uh, basically identify all these um, star forming regions. And, um, and, and a lot of them are noted here, but uh, here are some Spitzer observations of some of these uh, regions. So uh, the Eco Nebula with the pillars of creation um, is M16. The Omega Nebula is another uh, nebula uh, with lots of stars forming that uh, are part of this uh, spur or part of this uh, break. And so is the Triffid Nebula and the Lagoon Nebula. And when they, um, again, because they um, combine observations from Spitzer and the, um, as well as the Gaia satellite that locates the stars really accurately, they're able to place um, these objects, uh, these star forming regions. So those yellow stars in this figure represent the star forming regions um, you know, that, they, that they looked at. And uh, the big um, um, sort of red line um, in the figure to the right represents the structure that they've identified. And that picture on the right is kind of a zoom in to that Sagittarius arm um, image to the left, which is um, a, a zoomed out view. And you can see some, again, some of those uh, M16, M17, M20, M8. Uh, M8 is the Lagoon Nebula. These are star forming regions that um, you've probably heard of. But again, they all um, line up. So, uh, it, um, and when they measure the velocities of stars in these regions, they also um, appear to be uh, part of a very coherent structure. And so um, the question then is, you know, um, what um, processes could have um, shifted or moved uh, these um, star forming regions, these um, clouds and these groups of young stars into the shape? And, um, and this is a, 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 you know, a, a new structure in the Milky Way. Before we thought our Milky Way just consisted of these smooth spiral arms. We had, didn't have the tools to give us accurate observations or observations that were accurate enough to show such a weird looking structure. But when we look at other galaxies, we do see uh, similar spurs. Um, and sometimes they call them feathers because when you look at spiral galaxies, um, this is a paper from 2006 where the authors looked at um, Hubble Space Telescope observations of spiral galaxies. And uh, off of the main spiral arms, you see these kind of um, spurs or feathers that come out. And so these are additional um, figures from their paper and they show all the different locations um, in these different spiral galaxies where they noticed um, different um, spur-like objects. Um, and so it does seem to be pretty common throughout the universe. So it is kind of exciting to know uh, or to find out that our uh, own spiral galaxy, our own Milky Way, isn't that different uh, from some of these other galaxies. Um, it's just been extraordinarily difficult to observe a structure like this because, again, you know, it's hard to see the forest for the trees because we live um, in our Milky Way. Our sun is located in it, and so it's hard to discern the structure when you're stuck inside of it. And as far as you know, what astronomers think um, cause um, these feathering um, shapes, there are a lot of um, different ideas um, and they include you know, things like gravitational instabilities um, where the gas can become unstable and they collapse into uh, these structures. Um, there could be um, shocks um, coming through the gas because of supernovae um, and there could be uh, perhaps there are supernova, um, mul multiple supernovae going off and you, um, you create what are known as um, super bubbles, these bubbles of expanding um, gas and they push into the surrounding gas in the galaxy and they create these walls that show up as these feathers or these spurs. And right now there isn't um, um, one theory or one hypothesis that's totally accepted. There's still a lot of ideas out there, but I think what's kind of exciting is that, you know, not only do we have these other examples to look at that are outside of our own galaxy, but now we have an example in, inside of our galaxy to observe 
and to try and understand. So, um, you know, it shows how, um, again, um, new observatories, better telescopes, new data results in these um, really exciting um, result um, observations and results. And, um, and it kind of spurs us um, to um, further our understanding about how not only our galaxy can evolve and what its shape um, is like, but um, what's happening with other galaxies as well. All right, so that's um, the three stories I wanted to talk about. And Jose, I'm happy to hear from you to find out what the questions are. I'm sure there are lots of them because I see lots of text in the chat. Yes, we have lots of questions. I am going to make our view a little bit more equitable here. <laughs> But you are the expert, so I'm going to defer to you, I have to say. Also, I really appreciated your inclusion of William Herschel's map in there. William Herschel, one of my favorite astronomers, yeah. you know, discovered Uranus. Yeah. Was the first person to prove that there's types of light we can't see with our eyes. So that had a big impact on astronomy. And not a lot of people know him. Everybody loves Newton and Galileo, but uh, William Herschel was waiting in the wings. Um, but we do act, uh, we do, um, have a lot of questions in the chat for you. We've been getting them all throughout the program. They are excellent, excellent questions. I'm going to start with a question that is directly related to what you were just talking about. We had some folks wonder how or why does the Milky Way spin or form spirals? What are the processes that cause that to happen? Why not spheres? Why disks? Why spirals? Yeah, so, so that's a really good question. And uh, I might as well you know, share my screen again just so we can go back and look at um, a picture of the Milky Way. So let's just go back. And, um, and we think, um, you know, the Milky Way is, is a spiral galaxy and spiral galaxies are relatively flat, uh, meaning the disk, which the spirals sit in, um, is a, a very um, thin structure. So we think the Milky Way is about 100,000 light years across and the thickness of the Milky Way um, on average might be only, you know, a, a, a thousand or you know, a couple thousand light years. Um, of course, it, um, it all depends on how you define um, where the edge of the Milky Way ends, just because um, there isn't a sharp boundary. As if you look at the disk, stars just um, start petering out. And so there are fewer and fewer stars um, as you um, go further above the disk or below the disk, but the stars don't completely disappear. And so um, you know, defining a, a sharp boundary for the Milky Way is really difficult to do, but you can roughly say that uh, the Milky Way is you know a thousand and a couple thousand light years on average, but it does thicken up in, in the center. Um, but um, spiral galaxies um, seem to um, emerge um, due to uh, well, all galaxies come out of the Big Bang and out of um, gas from the Big Bang, and the Big Bang re resulted in an expanded universe. But gravity um, pulls matter together. And so gravity is the one um, super important force in the evolution of all, um, you know, pretty much all structure that we see in the universe. And, um, and what happens is, um, as when gravity pulls in um, gas um, towards a galaxy, um, it, it's in a, in part of the galaxy will have formed stars, but um, what will happen is that the gas tends to pile up into a disk. And so um, as that gas piles up, it naturally forms a disk. You naturally have um, gas um, rotating or orbiting in a very similar direction. But um, what happens over time is that that gas uh, forms stars, and uh, and and then because the uh, stars come out of um, the the gas, which is already in a, in a disk, most of the stars are also orbiting um, in that disk. Uh, more or less in the same direction, um, although um, stars will gravitationally interact with each other, and so the orbits can be, you know, um, a lot more complicated than simple circles. But the other thing that happens is that um, at the same time that gas is falling into these galaxies, um, galaxies are also merging with each other, and um, and so that's the other process that happens is that gravity is pulling in galaxies so that they um, collide, um, they orbit one another, and then they eventually merge, and um, there are different things that can happen. It turns out that uh, the gas can collide and settle because the, gla the gas the gas clouds you can think of as just these giant objects that can merge with each other. But the stars um, are so small compared to the distances between them 
that they basically pass through each other. And so the stars never collide, even um, when the galaxies are merging and colliding, uh, but the stars will still gravitationally interact. And so when you have galaxies um, merged with other galaxies, the stars tend to get um, jumbled and their orbits uh, tend to um, create orbits that are, are uh, much more um, chaotic um, looking than what you find in, in disk um, galaxies. And so we think that um, the stars that make up um, the bulge of the Milky Way, that central region that's um, yellower, um, those tend to be um, older stars. Um, those have been kind of pumped up uh, because of past mergers uh, with the Milky Way. And, uh, and over time, you know, we, we think that the, our Milky Way galaxy eventually collide with the Andromeda galaxy. And these, now you have two you know, giant uh, spiral galaxies uh, merging. And uh, the end result of that is a giant elliptical galaxy. Um, and that's just because the, uh, the star orbits get scrambled and they form an elliptical galaxy. So now I've kind of uh, built up all this uh, uh, the introductory material so that I can start talking about the star arms. Well, um, like I said earlier, the, the stars tend to orbit in very close to circular um, orbits. You know, not quite, but they all tend to orbit in the same direction. And so the spiral arms are actually a pattern that's superimposed on top of the star orbits. So the um, so when you look at the spiral arms, um, there's um, you can imagine them being sort of like a traffic jam in um, in the Milky Way as stars are orbiting. So stars will enter the spiral arm, they enter this traffic jam, and as they continue to orbit, you know they'll slow down because all the other stars have slowed down. And then as they continue their orbit, they eventually exit out of the traffic jam and suddenly they're not in as dense of an area with all, as many stars as they were before. Just as you know, if you imagine you're driving on I-25 on the highway, you know, you suddenly come into the slowdown um, and suddenly you're going really slow and then eventually you exit the slowdown. Um, but if you look at like a Google map of where the traffic is, there's like this red zone um, where the traffic is really slow but that red area always kind of stays or hovers in that same spot. And, um, you know, it's not the same cars stuck in that um, region. It's just that um, there's just this one part of the road of the highway where things slow down. And that's the same thing that's happening with stars in the Milky Way. And it turns out that um, depending on the dynamics of the stars, gravitational interactions of stars orbiting um, in such a manner, um, these uh, spiral patterns can actually um, self-generate, they can um, come out of nothing. So uh, these spiral patterns are of still of int intense interest for astronomers just because, you know, they, um, people are still uh, figuring out how exactly they work, especially in the context of their own Milky Way, but um, there are patterns that naturally come out of the dynamics of stars in orbit around galaxies, and um, stars tend not to stay in these traffic jams and we just go, come in and come out of the traffic jams as they were. That's really interesting. <laughs> I know from working at the museum as an educator that describing gravity is a really complex concept because we have the everyday gravity that we deal with. If I let something go, it will fall down. And, and that doesn't seem to comport with the gravity that we see out in space. But of course, the thing we have to remember is when we let that object go, it's not going straight down, it's going in a spiral itself, it's going in a circle, because we are also going in a circle around the center of the Earth. And we see these disks in the rings of Saturn and these accretion, uh, these protoplanetary disks that you were talking about at the beginning of the program. And so there's a lot of forces coming together to contribute to that shape. And I love your analogy of the traffic jam, because I, I'm sure if the highway were invisible, you would say, wow, look at all those cars right there. And then there's a bunch of, there's very few cars moving really quickly over here. And since gravity is invisible, that's what we have to kind of work with, right? Now, speaking of uh, the, the accretion that you were talking about, the formation of moons around exoplanets and these accretion disks, do these new theories or understandings that we have inform some of the mysteries in our own solar system, like Venus's backwards rotation or Uranus's extreme tilt? Um, they, they, um, they're part of those explanations because we know that um, you know, the, um, the early solar system, when there was still an accretion disk with uh, gas and dust and you know, lots of debris, I mean, you had, um, you can imagine, you know, it was a very chaotic environment. 
and we had these protoplanets and they, you know, you have gravity from them, but um, you had these asteroid sized bodies, you had objects that were hundred kilometers across, a thousand kilometers across, and they have their own gravity as well. I mean, everything has gravity, but the larger the, uh, the more mass of the object, the more gravity it has. And so it was, you can imagine, you know, it being a very chaotic regime where things are in orbit around the sun, but as they, you know, um, come near um, other objects that are also you know, massive, they can deviate from their orbits and they can smash together. And, um, and so we think that, um, you know, over time, uh, because of this um, sort of chaos of objects, um, you know, orbiting around the sun, but also under the influence of the gravity of everything else, else around it, you can have scenarios where, you know, Venus can get tipped over and can have its rotations um, slowed down by quite a bit. Um, you can have um, Uranus tipped over on its side. And, um, and we also think that the, um, you know, the orbits of the planets where they are today, um, they, you know, weren't, um, ha haven't always been where they currently are. The planets themselves have actually migrated and shifted. And that's because they've interacted with the disk. They've interacted with the gas and the dust that's in the disk and these gravitational interactions cause planets to migrate. And so, you know, the, those are, um, you know, all, all, all these ideas are still under very intense um, exploration and research by scientists, um, just because you, know, you can imagine it takes a lot of computer power to um, create these simulations. You always want to have more and more, you know, precision and accuracy in your computations to try and you know, figure out exactly how the solar system um, was constructed. But we think that there was you know, a lot of things going on um, to, um, to account for the different types of um, orbits and the different types of orientations and rotations of the solar system bodies. And it's, you know, it's, it is also still amazing to, you know, look at Jupiter and think that, you know, Jupiter was probably like a miniature solar system. I mean, it is like a miniature solar system today, but even early on, it probably formed like a miniature solar system. Yeah, it's pretty incredible. I mean, and we're of course talking about processes that take hundreds of millions of of years, I mean, extremely long time for these things to shift and change. It just gives a lot of perspective to the real, how, you know, how lucky we are in our little blink of a cosmic eye we've been on our planet to appreciate some of these things and study them. And I see some folks in the chat keep coming back to this concept of disks. They're coming back to this concept of spirals. And, and, and the, the big question that people are having is why spirals? What is it about spirals? And, and you know, they're hearing gravity, they're hearing movements, they're hearing all of this. Um, but the, I think the bridge that needs to be built is, what is it about gravity that creates the spiral? What is the impetus? Like if you're stirring water on a stove, it's, this, it's the spoon that starts the spinning. Um, so what is that force? And if it's gravity, how is that happening? Yeah, it's gravity, um, but it's also the fact that um, gravity is a force that um, drops off um, the distance. So that means, you know, the further away you are, the weaker the gravity becomes. And so, um, you know, this isn't, um, I'm not sure I, I have a good way of really explaining it, but let's go back to um, just this other, let's go back to the, the first, very first story. And I showed this um, computer simulation. Yeah, this one. So this isn't um, you know, going to totally explain it, but you know, again, um, the, the whole idea behind this is that you have two sources of gravity. You have um, gravity coming from the star and that's keeping everything in orbit. Um, and, um, but um, the gravity from the star um, drops off with distance, uh, meaning it gets weaker as you get further out. And so that means um, to stay in orbit, you don't have to go as fast. Um, and so um, another way to think about, you know, we normally think of gravity. Okay, so nice. um, are you sharing your screen? Oh, wait, no, did I? There we go. <laughs> there we Sorry. go. There we go. Okay, let, let, let's try this again. Uh, there we go. Yeah, thanks for pointing that out. Um, so so there, um, the, the gravity from the star um, weakens um, as you get further away. And uh, so the stuff that's orbiting close in is orbiting faster. Um, than the stuff that's orbiting uh, far away. And that's just because they have to move faster in order not to fall into the star. So normally, you know, when we um, look around us, we think of gravity as something that um, pulls us down, right? So I have a pen 
and I drop the pin, it's going to fall down. Um, well, uh, why does uh, something orbit around a star, why does it fall um, in towards the star? Well, it is being pulled by the star, but um, the, the gas or a planet around um, our solar system or a satellite around the Earth, the reason it doesn't fall towards the center is because it has enough of the sideways velocity that um, it's moving fast enough that it falls around the, the, um, the central object instead of falling in towards it. So as long as you, you're moving fast enough, um, horizontal or perpendicular to the pull of gravity, you can fall around instead of falling in. And um, so, so that's what's happening here. And uh, let's see if I can, we just need to keep playing this. Um, so everything is falling around, but they um, are also falling around at different speeds. And so you can imagine that because things are moving at different speeds, you um, end up with um, different um, patterns that show up at different distances. And, um, and so this is all a function of, you know, um, of the distances, as well as the, uh, the different um, strengths of gravity um, from the central object that's pulling on you. And so, um, and, and that um, sort of, I mean, that's not a really complete explanation, but that is where you can um, create structure like these spiral patterns, because again, um, you know, the force of gravity is just pulling inward. So how, why would you expect uh, a spiral pattern to, to come up? And again, it has to do with the fact that um, the strength of gravity changes the further away you are, it weakens. And so that leads to um, the, these effects where when you um, add, them, add them up over time and you also watch them over time, you can build up these patterns that um, weren't obvious uh, before. That is, I think that's a really great explanation. Thank you, Kuchu. And of course, not only is it action that, you know, the, the, as you get further away, gravity changes, but everything has gravity. So depending on how much stuff you're made out of, you're gonna have more versus less. I'm made out of mass, so I have gravity, but it's infinitesimal compared to the gravity of the earth. So the earth acts on me in a much more significant way. That's an excellent explanation. We're just about at the end of our time together, but we also, I had a few questions about your seg during your segment where you talked about Betelgeuse. So I wanted to grab one of those. And one of the things that you talked about was how a, a portion of Betelgeuse cooled down and that caused the condensation of the gas cloud around the star. Uh, the sun seems pretty consistent to me and so do the other stars in the sky. So what is it about Betelgeuse? Why would this section of star cool down while the rest of it is warm? Yeah, that's a really good question. And I'm not a, an expert on um, you know, stellar theories um, and people who do computational um, simulations of, of stars like this. But um, the, uh, probably the best explanation that I can give is to think of um, stars you know, as having um, an energy source at their center. And, um, and the energy comes from nuclear fusion and it's this nuclear fusion that drives the star, that provides the light, the heat, the, all the radiation that we get from the star. And uh, for different stars, there are different ways for that energy to get out. And, um, and it, um, if a star is hot enough, um, all the, um, well, and, I mean, one way is for the radiation uh, for the photons to just um, come out. But um, it turns out that um, because the star you know, can be very dense with gas, um, the, the photons um, will bounce around um, electrons and protons um, in the ionized, um, you know, the ionized gases that make up the interior of the star. Um, and so um, you know, for our sun, an electron, uh, a photon can actually take many thousands of years to escape from the center of, 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 the, of the star where the fusion is taking place. Now, if, um, because of um, the, um, it turns out that different compositions of, of the star, you know, different elements that make up the star in addition to the hydrogen and helium that make up the bulk of the gas in the star, but um, the different um, elements um, in addition to hydrogen and helium, but also hydrogen and helium, and also different temperatures, they have um, different effects, meaning they have different levels of transparency or opacity to the radiation. And so you can have um, an effect where the gas, you know, even though we think of gas as you know, the air in your atmosphere is, is gas, and it appears to be very transparent to the light that we observe, but in some cases, the gas can be very opaque to um, inside the star, to the radiation. 
And so what can happen is that you can have packets of um, gas inside the star that just heats up because the, the radiation, radiation cannot escape. Wow. And, and what happens is the star ends up boiling. So if you think about, you know, when you um, think about uh, your pot of water uh, boiling on your stovetop, and what happens is um, there's a lot of heat um, that you put into um, a, a parcel of water at the bottom of the part, pot. And what happens is, you know, that um, the heat can escape. And so the water expands and it becomes lighter than the water around it. And then it bubbles up. And um, once it reaches the top, it releases that, um, that heat, um, you know, maybe in, in a little uh, spout of steam. Um, and then it cools up. And then now it can kind of um, fall back down to be reheated. That's something that we call convection. We're heating from the bottom, it comes up and uh, it um, cools off and um, it sinks and after it cools and to be reheated again. And so it turns out stars can also convect uh, just because uh, the parcels of gas, uh, because of their conditions, are actually are opaque to the radiation. Mm. And so our sun um, actually has a convective layer at the very top. And so if you've ever looked at uh, telescope images of like very small parts of the sun, you can actually make out convective cells. And for uh, super red giant stars like Betelgeuse, their convective cells are um, actually a significant fraction of the size of the star, like you know, like a quarter of the star or a third of the star. And so that's what uh, people's computer simulations are showing that you can have these enormous convective cells. And, and when I, you know, I mentioned, I, um, I didn't really describe it. I just talked about the star surface being boiling or roiling. And, and it literally is like a boiling because it's convection that's taking place. And so, you know, perhaps, you know, what people are imagining is that you have this convective cell where you have this huge bubble of gas come up to the surface and it's released its energy and it's cooled off. And now you have this big chunk of gas that's cooled up and it's so it's now darker and it's about to sink back down. But, you know, but of course, you know, it, um, the star is very complex, it's rotating. And so perhaps, you know, as it's cooled up, it's rotated over to a part where um, that radiation uh, support is no longer there and it cools off the gas uh, that's external to the star. So uh, the, the, the part of the star that's darker uh, probably has to do with the convection. And that's coming from non-expert. I don't feel like I'm- But it, I feel like it. it's safe to say that our star is at a gentle boil and mm -hmm. Betelgeuse is at a rolling boil. Yeah. <laughs> well, We've got some excellent questions in the chat. Unfortunately, we are out of time. I, I, I'm sorry we weren't able to get to all those questions out there, but I'd say hold on to those questions, hold on to that curiosity. Come visit us if you can at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. We'd be delighted to see you and try to answer your questions in and any other questions that you might have. As a science educator there, I'll do my best. I'm not as, knowledge as, as, uh, not as knowledgeable as you, Kachun, but I'll, I'll give it the old college try. And- uh, <laughs> Katun, thank you so much for spending uh, your hour with us this evening and sharing that knowledge. I really appreciate it. Thank you all out, of, uh, out there in the universe for joining us this evening for 60 Minutes in Space. You will be able to join us again. The next 60 Minutes in Space will be on September 29th, so feel free to put those on your calendars. And we hope to see you then. Stay curious, and we hope you have a good rest of your evening. Goodbye, everybody. Good night, everyone. Bye-bye.